I start again. Uh, so we were at governmental interaction and we were looking at demonic structures. Uh, so when you say principalities and powers, powers mean those who have demonic power over sections of society, for instance, over gambling uh, or violence. So people involved in gambling, thieves, go to a certain power to get demonic favor before they go on their thieving. In Sri Lanka, there's a particular name for that prayer, that power. Principalities are more territorial uh, jurisdictions, so a certain province is under a certain principality, <coughs> excuse me, and, and a certain power uh, rules over uh, money, for instance. So Mammon is a world authority, Cosmocratoras, ruler of the darkness of the world. So in Ephesians 6 verse 10, you have rulers of the darkness of this world, Cosmocratoras. Uh, so uh, Mammon is a worldwide principality. Uh, Mammon comes, I think, from the Syriac or Aramaic, when Jesus said, you can't serve God and Mammon. So the, you can see in every nation, there's a representation of the demon of Mammon. So people into gambling, I think a, a Chinese ethnicity is quite, uh, quite strongly influenced by this principality. Uh, so people into gambling invoke this principality and in different regions of the world, uh, Mammon will have different names and Mammon will have pictures and form formations that involve money and coins and things like that. So I hope you understood. Principalities, uh, principalities are like chief ministers, they have political jurisdiction and terrains. Powers are, peop are evil spirits that are in charge of different sin sectors, if you may, in charge of different iniquities and transgressions, working against God-created design, involving human beings. So uh, powers that rule over violence, uh, different, different powers. Uh, I think you've got an idea of demonic structures. So just handle them as they come. If they come for a cell meeting, whole cell gets together and delivers the person. And that particular uh, power uh, lost its grip on one person, so loses the grip in the area. And if a uh, you know the beginning of uh, Paul Yongicho's ministry, he itemizes how he saw in a dream he was battling for the life of a lady and a python spirit and so on. And in fact, in that area, those who threatened his ministry and was going to come and kill him uh, when he just started in, in a huge junkyard and that particular family, very powerful in the area, had a daughter who had got crippled. That night that he was battling in prayer in his prayer place, because the next day they were coming to kill him, they had said. And that night, that daughter in that house saw uh, the servant of God coming and releasing her from the grip of this python, this serpent spirit that kept her paralyzed. She got healed instantly. By his intercession, he was doing for himself and the ministry and the area in his little church hut. And next day, of course, the whole lot came and told what happened. He thought they, are, they, they came to kill him. He was with eyes closed in prayer. Nothing happened. And they said, this is what happened. You visited our daughter and she got deliverance. To see, not him, the daughter saw a, a vision of how the pastor came and delivered. Powerful, isn't it? It can happen anywhere. And deliver an entire section of the village. Yes. So those are demonic structures. In Sri Lanka, we have a particular demon that manifests near, near, near the well side when girls go to draw water. Usually by, say, that spirit is invoked or sent by a jilted lover and, uh, and, and that, that, that demon really scratches. You see scratch marks on the body. So demonics are real, but evangelism, anointing of the Holy Spirit, blood of Jesus Christ, is the way deliverance comes. Then we go to generational succession. How in church government, 
if you have a Paul, a Timothy, a Paphras, a Paphroditus, then a Philemon in Colossae, and then Onesimus, whom Paul meets in prison, third generation Christian, so Paul ministers to Philemon, and Paul ministers to Onesimus, and Paul says, Philemon, that's the epistle of Philemon, please accept Onesimus as your son, but he's my son. If he has sinned against you, uh, put it to my account. Tremendous, isn't it? Philemon, the New Testament mechanics, mechanics of fatherhood, sonship in the generation. So I have already described you 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Uh, I, Paul, what you, Timothy, saw from me, Paul, what you saw and heard, commit thou to faithful men, fab people, faithful and able, to teach others, four generations in it. So if a church has four generational succession, that's a strong, cohesive church of continuity. What often happens is the worship leader runs off with some people because of his worship gift, teaching elder runs off with some people with his teaching gift, and the evangelist says, I want to do my own thing, and he sets up his own church, when God did not call him to be a pastor. So church fractures all the time. Very few churches work through to four generational succession intentionally. So church has lost its government. And how can church hold a nation in governance? So we have to get back to basics of apostle, pastor, working with uh, their progeny, spiritual progeny for coming generations. So that's a, a little... I have a book called Rocking Rome. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'll send a copy to Ron. It's available as an e-download also. Rocking Rome, uh, how church happened in the New Testament. Taking, it's a commentary on the epistle to Philemon. Small little epistle, uh, but I have made a, a quite a thick book on it here. Yeah. Uh, so that gives us uh, insight, intimate insights to how first, first century church was into generation succession. So Paul said you may have many instructors, but I begot you in Christ. This should be the gold standard for every pastor, for the congregation you are doing. You should be able to say that I begot you in Christ, not in arrogance, as father of the house. Uh, so unfortunately, there are many pharaohs in God's house, many managers in God's house, uh, but few fathers. So it's a fatherless generation in the corporate, fatherless generation in the church, and we expect fathers in politics. Oxymoron, isn't it? It's a contradiction. Let's model fatherhood in the church that the nation may learn fathers that there'll be again role models and fathers in professions, in the corporate, in business houses, and in politics also. Yes. So that is generation succession to the fourth generation. Psalm 78 is excellent on generations. Please read Psalm 78. Then secular government. We, I think we have done a lot about government in government. So I told you at present, uh, our president has divided uh, the country's economic productivity into 40 sections and we are praying closely on each of those sections and we are praying that there will be real Christians coming there and Isaiah 45 will happen bronze doors will change what are bronze doors? places of judgment that close down so nations have gates of provision Malaysia has their own rubber and whatnot. Sri Lanka also has a bit of rubber, more tea, coconut, and different gates of provision. Gates of provision God has given need silver doors of men who know God that make it happen for the nation's betterment. What are bronze doors? Things that got shut because of judgment, bad behavior, bloodshed, injustice, all that causes bronze doors. So we have to instruct the head of state and say, look, nation has gates of provision, which is from God, but they need silver doors. Men of integrity, men of character, men of God in business who can make it happen. So that's a quick overview of Isaiah 45, how treasures get translated from darkness to the light. And so there'll be good business practices, no demonics, no sinful practices, 
redeeming a nation and its economy. Christians in the marketplace. This is a long, long topic. I have a book called Gatekeepers. Book called Gatekeepers. Uh, taking from the Esther Mordecai model, working together. Maybe I need to say, I, I have another book called Prayer Governance, uh, Melchizedek, uh, Order of Government, uh, quite a few. Then I have another one called Forward Defense Line about prayer. Maybe I should send a copy each of these things to your library. Library. Uh, so Christians in the Marketplace is a long topic. Uh, Basically, my pitch is this. Pastor has to be educated about how to be, how a Christian can be effective in the marketplace. If you try to drag him out of the marketplace and make him a good deacon and good elder, he will not be fulfilling his function in the marketplace. Secondly, he, not be, he, not, he may not want to come and do it. Thirdly, if you do not give a, a chairman or a professor of university a good mesiological purview of what he can be as a Christian in the church and in the marketplace, he will probably give his zeal only for his profession. So pastors are gatekeepers, pastors are stewards of God's gifts to give people space and time, how they may best serve God in their generation, in their profession. So pastor can't get intimidated, Pastor can't be dog in a manger, uh, speaking all the time. When there are professors, teachers, senior men in the marketplace sitting in your congregation, they want to be participants in the transformation process, in the church process. So uh, pastors need corporate training. Pastors need professional training. You'll have to think this long. If you send your young, earnest church youngsters at the age of 18, 19, 22 Bible colleges, they return to be associate pastors in a church. They have no equipment to face life, no management, no finance management, no professional management, no knowledge other than theology. Such a church will not disciple the marketplace. So we need our best youngsters first get trained in a field. It doesn't take long, four years, and then take to full-time ministry if it's necessary. So in our system, we work with bivocational pastors as long as possible, uh, so till the congregation uh, grows big, and then uh, he and we together ask the Lord and ask each other, do you have a call from God to come into full-time ministry? Otherwise, why should he lose his income? Why should he lose his space in the marketplace? He can be bivocational pastor. Paul was tent maker for a long time when the church couldn't support him. He was apostle, but he earned for himself. Not only that, in Acts 20 he says, my hands earn for everybody else on my team. If that's good for Paul, how are we missing that? So my pitch is this, when young fellows are 20 and keen, send them for corporate management. Get them trained there for four years, five years. Let them hear God's call. Meanwhile, they are very involved in church ministry. Uh, they may be doing a course in a Bible college, but they are learning their onions, nitty gritty details in the marketplace where they want to have their rulership. We have to be ambassadors of Christ. Uh, all things to all men, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 9. And John Wesley said, do good with, uh, do good all the time to all the people. It's all you have, all you can. He, he had an axiom like that. He also said, earn as much as you can and save as much as you can and give to God as much as you can. And the pastor said, Amen for the last one, but businessmen have to agree to all three. Earn as much as you can, save as much as you can, give to God as much as you can. Christians in the marketplace. Uh, final point on this slide is about kings and priests, prayer government, the Melchizedek role. 
I think I did it adequately in the earlier slides. Uh, next slide is uh, just a view of how white horse, red horse, black horse, pale horse plays out. We have done it. Uh, slide, ne slide number 52, authority of the Great Commission. So this is my one of my main points. Uh, behold, I give unto you exousia uh, in heaven and earth, authority in heaven and earth to go disciple. Uh, so that Mathe Tivsati teach, walk, work, teach, walk, work. Uh, together in a discipling relationship that takes on the work field as well and people involved with you in work. So you have a group of 12 with whom you are working and of course some of them will be church members as well. Matthew 28, 19. So I'm saying touch every mountain peak. So even at the helm of a mount, you know, mountain is government or business or sports or army or whatever it is, right at the helm there may be men of peace who are yearning for peace. Uh, so in 2008, one of the best known conglomerates in Sri Lanka got into trouble, but just through that, uh, a chairman came through to Christ. Uh, so uh, we, you are ever watchful that men of peace may be at, maybe University Don, maybe a chairman, uh, different, different things, you know. So men of peace may be at the top. You always pray for the top because if the top changes, the effect trickles down. But we are conscious of the poor, the lowly, humble. They all can believe. So we always have a ministry to the humble, poor, unknown people. They also must get saved. Middle of the mountain also has to get saved. Principle of the man of peace is this, Luke 10.6. When you go to a place, look for the person who may be looking for salvation. There's always a person like that. I have traveled extensively in our nation and in different places I came across a man of peace in different, different ways. Uh, that's how God places him. One of my our strong friends, uh, elder and a pastor in the church, is a prophet also. Uh, he, I met him in 1992, miraculously, uh, quite unexpectedly. I did not know him. He had only heard my name, uh, but he's a dear person now. Uh, their company is very much into the coconut industry and this comes from their company. Uh, so uh, he's fully in the business world and he's fully in the church also. So it is possible. Isaiah 52, 15, and I have told you about the, at the height of the war, the commander of their force was, uh, was in the, uh, was in our church. So every day he prayed with me before he sat in the Security Council. He's at present the governor of the Western Province. So since 1995, from his very young days, we have walked together. That's a long time. How many years? 25 years. He has walked in one church and served in government in increasingly influential positions. It is possible. Uh, then Isaiah 52, 15, sprinkling of nations by the blood. Already, uh, we believe, our nation was, Christ saw our nation on the cross. So that's a great imperative. He sprinkled our nation. We, de facto, uh, de jure, he sprinkled our nation. De facto, we are working out in daily evangelism, discipleship, and church building. Yes. Uh, Next one, wheat and tares. We have about half an hour more, I think. Wheat and tares. Uh, what shall we do, Paul? S speak for 10 minutes and have questions? Sure. I'll, sure, I'll, sure. Yeah, I'll do the wheat and tares and maybe we'll go for questions. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so this comes from Matthew chapter 13. Uh, if you remember the parable, let me read it with you maybe, Matthew chapter 13. So uh, as uh, our power, authority comes from reading the word of God. So my wife and I read 10 chapters together and then we read more when we have to get on to exposition and so on. So reading the scripture is daily bread and butter jam and nasi lemma for 
or every pastor. We have to read scriptures more than any believer. That's how we retain our pastorate. So reading scripture, always writing, checking out commentaries, exegesis, and uh, I take about six to seven, eight hours of the day. Yeah, okay, six about six hours of the day at least for my praying and studying scripture. I have to do it. Uh, my day is not done. Have I not done six to seven hours of scripture and prayer and all that? So Matthew chapter 16 has, uh, Matthew chapter 13 has tears. Jesus presented another parable, 1324, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, so the good man is the father, he sowed good seed, and good, good, good man's men asked, we went to sleep. Then the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. So when a nation is not watched in prayer, my wife was very strong on this, watching at 12 midnight as the nation begins. When a nation is not watched in prayer, evil tears, dangerous men get sown into the system, politics, commerce, real anti antichrist fellows, beast ruling fellows. They are waiting to take the nation hellwards. You have to watch them. Why, why, why was the enemy able to sow? Because good men, the servants went to sleep. They didn't watch the nation in prayer. They went to sleep. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident. The slaves of the landowner, landowner is of course God, we are the servants. Kaiman said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? So we take it literally that God has already sown reasonable men in government, reasonable men in corporate business, reasonable men in universities, in education, in every mountain. God has done his part. Our part is to take the gospel to them. Other parties not allow unreasonable evil men to rise into positions that can scuttle a nation and scuttle the church. So who, how did Hitler came into office? The whole Lutheran Church agreed with Hitler's Aryan race. Germans are the greatest race. And, and the, all the bishops said hurrah. Other than Martin E. Moller, the youngest bishop, he got up and said, Her Chancellor, we don't need your third race to make, make us great. God has made us great. He landed in prison. But when war ended, Nimala was still alive. And he was the voice of reason and sanity to German that had lost its onions going after Hitler. No way that such a strongly Christian Lutheran uh, Germany could have gone behind Hitler other than that the bishops went blind with Aryan pride. Nimala alone stood to him. You know the famous statement, he said, they came for the communists, I didn't speak for them. They came for the trade unions. I didn't speak for them. They came for the uh, Jews. I didn't speak for them. They came for me. There was no one to speak for me. So, bishops and blind. So, that's how evil men get sown. Uh, then they said, do you want us to go and gather them up? God, uh, The master says, no. Verse 29, Matthew 13, 29. No. While you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. So, Uprooting tares is not our business. Watching and preventing them is our business. And planting the good seed is our business. Preach the gospel. Bring more to Christ. Uh, verse 30, allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in, in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, so God will send the angels, reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles. So angels will do God's severity we will do God's goodness. So world is God's field, kingdom seed planted for restoration, governing fathers went to sleep. <clears throat> so tears grew. Now there's a time the world's kingdom will become the kingdom of Christ. That's the <clears throat> subject of the book of Revelation. Angels will do the uprooting. Suns shine 
in the Father's kingdom. Uh, we have about 20 minutes. Shall we go for questions? What do you say? All right. Do you have any question? You can ask Dr. Lalit. I want to say at the onset, we have not got it all together. What we have learned in daily prayer and practice, we try to be faithful. So a lot of things in Sri Lanka needs great help. Please pray for us also. Yes, any questions? Uh, how did you start to go into uh, touching the, the, the country? How did you start it? What was the thing that made you start it? Give us some idea. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, the registrar to the professor of medicine in Colombo, very bent on an academic career. We, I had topped my batch in every exam. Uh, and then we got a scholarship to go to UK. Had we gone, we would have never come. My wife is a lawyer. She got three first classes in a law exam. God called us from heaven directly, saying, you will now serve me. We obeyed. So we initially went without stipend or any promise to a village in Sri Lanka. We began our ministry there, just trusting God by faith, with no promises from anyone. Uh, long story short, few faithful believers gathered and some, a friend gave us a house in Colombo and uh, we got into our system early, John 2021, 20, even as the Father has sent me, I send you, we felt we had a direct call from heaven. We did not know apostles and prophets or any such thing. We have never been to Bible college. We had only been to medical college and law faculty, law college. Uh, and then we were very strong that God sent us to that what God, God sent, he will supply somehow that got into us. Then in the grinding troubles of a village with a lot of demon possession, we learned uh, spiritual warfare. We were uh, fellowshipping in a church whose pastor was a judge of the Supreme Court. So from him, we got a lot of input that the highest in the land can come to Christ. We, as you know, a judge of the Supreme Court is a very high office. He was our pastor. Uh, God had touched him. He was a very good teacher, strong in the anointing and strong on integrity. So we picked up those things as young doctors and lawyers. And there were other professionals in that group. So we got a view early that highest in the land can serve God and should serve God. Uh, then my wife had a background of law, constitution, constitutional law and things like that. Uh, so we, what shall I say? God, I think, sees ahead what we will be becoming and trains us in our life journey. So in that first village with very few people, very few finances, we had our daughter by that time. She was very small uh, and our foster daughter was with us. Uh, we learned how the demonics work in a Sri Lankan grassroots level rural situation. Lots of demon possession, casting out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit became virtually daily bread and butter. I didn't have much uh, opportunity for uh, erudite theological treatise, but I studied all the time. That was my part of my making. And then we grew as a small rural church and a small urban church. And then in different situations in the city and in the villages, we met men of peace quite strategically by God design. We just run into them. Of course, we now know it is not running into them. God made it happen. And uh, sometimes they would read a little track or book from very early days I began to write, publish in our own language also. Uh, by God's grace, we had got language ability in our formative years, both in English and in our vernacular. So all our key leaders now, 
we met in miraculous moments of God interaction. A prophecy came, a word of knowledge came, someone told them. So we became an indigenous grown church. Uh, so our uh, one urban congregation and one rural congregation, then another rural congregation, another rural congregation, then someone from far away wrote to us saying, how can I know Christ? So then we visited that person. Uh, so we began in 1981. Then we got into our system that we have to face every exigency and trouble of the nation as if it's our trouble. So in 1988, there was an insurgency and uh, uh, where the Sinhala Marxists tried to overrun the country. We were in the thick of the prayer battle and visiting places and uh, uh, seeing people, doing clinics and, you know, at a time, insurgents were trying to overrun the country. Uh, so that gene also got into us at the worst time of the nation, be on the forefront, be the forward defense line. So from beginning, we were active in evangelism and discipleship and somehow sacrifice had been written into our spirit, maybe. So we grew one person at a time, not by strategy. When we met a person, we recognized, we got understanding about his gift and space and calling. And then he would uh, reach out to his neighborhood. Uh, we had no plan program of church growth. We only worked with people as men of peace who came our way and understanding how God has equipped them and had go how God has worked in them. They did not know Christ when we met them. And then how the Lord may use their life to reach their own milieu. That, that we, we, we didn't eject people. Uh, so we had to develop a training system where they did their job, did their cell group or group of 12. And we had to somehow get them theologically educated. So we developed monthly meetings where we sit down together. To this date, uh, we sit down together in a monthly meeting. Now we call it Pineal Prayer Parliament, but it will have theology, prayer, prophecy, then God began to supply our need in miraculous ways. So when city Christians get saved and learn giving, we had a blessing that they gave tithes and offerings quite faithfully. Then we would have a way of how to, how to keep uh, uh, church funded. Uh, so we, had, we never had to make desperate appeals asking for funds. When the urban church grows, they have uh, they have means to look after the rest of the church. That's how we grew. Is that an adequate answer? Or? Then, of course, we had vital input from friends we met. Uh, Pastor Jeremiah and Pastor Ron have come many times. They introduced us to the encounter program. We were quite strong on evangelism, apostolic. We didn't think much about inner healing at all. We thought it gets happened in the cross anyway. Uh, but when they came and did the encounter uh, program that New Life was doing, it was very helpful. We still carry on with those things. Then uh, other apostles or prophets came divinely connected. Uh, so they have had good input to us and enlarged our apostolic and prophet understanding of how to do church. Uh, so that's how we grew. Thank you, Pastor.